Welcome to lecture 9 of graph theory. So today we will learn about um, a very popular concept, an important concept uh, to analyze the structure of graphs, which is modularity. How to detect different modules or different communities of, um, in a graph. So our um, lecture is divided into three sections. The first one, um, I will introduce um, the definition of a module or a community. And in the second part, um, this is actually very interesting because now at this um, uh, stage, we'll see how different concepts concepts comes in uh, come in together. Like for example, betweenness centrality that we saw in lecture two. Uh, also, machine learning with some uh, with the previous lectures, what we um, self diffusion of similarity matrices, and all of these things we can use them now to detect modules uh, in a graph. So we will have a very quick overview um, of agglomerative and divisive clustering. And the last part is um, we will study this paper together, functional cart cartography of complex metabolic networks. So um, this is actually um, a very nice paper published in Nature 2005 and they design um, a new algorithm to detect modules in a graph. So basically, if we look at these two graphs, so we have, let's say, graph G1 and G2, you can clearly see that for the first graph, it is structured in different uh, big units or subunits, sub uh, like modules, we can call them modules or communities. So you can easily spot these when you look at the structure of the graph. Now, the key question is that if we have um, an input graph G and we want to autom automatically detect these modules, uh, how shall we proceed? What kind of approaches can we use to automatically label these modules and discover the, uh, the inherent pattern or structure of this graph. So in this case, uh, we have clearly four modules, but if you look at this one, what do you guys notice for this graph? So in this graph, you don't, it's not very clear if it has different modules or not. So in this case, there are, we say there are no noticeable modules. Okay, so basically not all graphs structure and uh, have the modularity um, aspect, some of them, but in case the graph is, um, has different communities, we want to learn how to detect those communities. Okay, so this is the problem we will look um, at today. So first, let's define uh, modularity. What is uh, modularity? So generally, nodes in real-world graphs, they aggregate into densely connected subgroups. And these densely connected subgroups, like these ones, okay, so you can see they're densely connected, interconnected. We call them modules, or also we can call them uh, communities, okay? So nodes within these modules are strongly connected with each other than other parts of the network. So you can see, for example, these guys here, the orange module, we have like a very strong connection between, so each node is strongly connected to all other nodes in, uh, in this sub-modules, but when you um, examine the relationship between, um, between modules, you will see there is only one, uh, one single connection, so they're not, the, the, the different modules are not strongly connected. And also, nodes from two different modules, let's say, a pink node will not be, uh, you know, will not be strongly connected to nodes from another module. So this will not happen. Usually, uh, you need to cross like a long path to reach a node from in another module. Okay. So, for example, where do we find modularity? Uh, it's almost everywhere, like different biological systems, even our brains, there are structured um, uh, connectivities in our brains, functional connectivity, it follows this uh, modularity um, structure. So in Facebook, for example, if you can look, if you look at social networks, you can see that friendships, they tend to be dense within certain group of people. For example, people sharing the same social interests. So. Um, and you can categorize them or cluster them very differently. differently. But uh, this is one example. Also, uh, here, this is for a simple modularity. You guys have other examples? 
you can think of where we find uh, like uh, graphs with high with different communities food web yes uh, any other things other ideas Okay, so there, if you think about it, you, you'll discover, you'll see that in real world, like, you know, um, there, there are many, many graphs that comprise uh, different modules and submodules. And also, we notice that there, there is hierarchical modularity, like even uh, in real world graphs. So what is hierarchical modularity? So here, um, we have these basically um, graphs where that are organized hierarchically in their modules such that they contain modules within modules okay so over several topological scales of resolution we can see that as we zoom in as we zoom um, um, on the graph we will we'll, we'll see more uh, fractal uh, modules appearing so for example if you guys look at this graph what we have here, we can have, we can see that we have the blue, the blue module. We have, let's say, the orange one, and then another one here. Let's call, put it green. Oops. And then the pink one. So how many uh, modules we have? This is at one resolution so this is you know let's call it scale one and then if I zoom out like if I look at a, a larger scale what do you guys know this there is also these bigger connections right here that connect these four modules so for forget about what's inside just look at these structures so I have structure one two three four and then I have these connections between them okay so in this case, if we will see that we have a bigger, a larger graph, and this graph has all these four submodules, okay? And then if we look at a single module, we also notice that there are submodules too. So it's a module within a module, so it's very simple. So this is one, two, three, and four, etc. And this is, you know, what we call a hierarchical, hierarchical modularity in a graph. So it's a module within a module. And modular graphs have strong within module uh, connectivity. Okay, so the connectivity within a single module, like for this one, for example, it is very strong. And it's a small number of intermodular module links to maintain a low characteristic path link of the network. So what does that mean? We have seen this before in uh, graph theory lecture six. So basically, here what we have, we have uh, within a module all nodes are strongly connected, but uh, inter-module connections there are very uh, there there is a very small number of connections between modules. Okay, like this one. Now. This is to maintain a low characteristic path length of the network. So what is a characteristic path length of, of a graph or a network? Where did we see this? You guys remember? Efficiency, right? Efficiency of information flow on a graph. And let me just refresh your memory. So this is, you know, uh, from lecture six, so we looked at this is the characteristic uh, uh, path, the, the short characteristic path length um, L, and here it's it, it's defined as uh, the average uh, the average basically path length along which the information can be routed between pairs of nodes using only a few connections. So here, why we have this? Because actually, if we completely remove these small Okay, this a small number, this these small, um, uh, these sparse connections between modules, we would not have any flow of information, information ac across modules or between modules, right? So these ones actually, they, they can guarantee that if I want to pass an information from this node 
to this node. Actually, uh, it's I can simply follow maybe this one. Okay, so there is an efficiency of information flow in in because due to this uh, modularity across the whole graph, like between different modules in the graph. Okay, so. Now there are different benefits. There are there are many benefits of modularity and hierarchical modularity. So and I would like you guys to, to ponder over those, like to think about these uh, characteristics, these um, uh, benefits, because to formalize a new problem, to create a new project, to design something, this modularity you can use it in in many different ways. Okay, so for example. I'll tell you a short, a very short story. So let's start from the beginning. So the Nobel laureate Herbert Simon, he's like um, an American economist and cognitive psychologist. He argued that modularity and hierarchical organization are essential ingredients for evolvability, flexibility, adaptability, and complexity of systems. So if you want a system that has all these attributes, it's evolvable, it's easily adaptable, it's flexible, although it is highly complex, then you should think about formalizing or building your system in a modular way, okay? So he gave two different, an example or um, uh, to illustrate this point. So he basically said, let's Hypothesize there are two watchmakers, okay? One is called Hora, the other one is called Tempest. So these two watchmakers, they want, they're, they're, they're making watches, okay? So what they do, they assemble different uh, pieces of the watches, like different parts together uh, in order to create the watch. But they adopt completely different strategies, okay? So Tempest, he assembles his watch so that each part is dependent on the other. So this is like a sequential way of working. So you start from zero till you finish it and you're done within a few hours, okay? So Hora, on the other hand, uh, assembles his watch using a piecemeal approach in which he constructs sub-assemblies consisting of 10 parts each, okay? So last, he will combine them all in, in the watch. So he breaks down a big task into subtasks, solve each subtask independently, and then basically aggregates them together to find the solution. Now, the problem is that imagine that, you know, um, these watchmakers, they get interrupted for any reason, okay? Now, what do you guys think? Which one would be able to uh, be more efficient in uh, finishing their task on time? Which one? It should be Hora. No, Tempest, because if you interrupt, if you interrupt him, the he needs to restart over again. Because let's say you're doing it sequentially, but you don't know there are so many pieces that are similar, you don't know where you have left off, so it might confuse you, and then you need to start over again, okay? So it's like, you know, having a big, uh, like a big puzzle, the easiest way is not to do it in a very mosaic manner, but try to put pieces, big pieces together, and put, you know, these big pieces, assemble them all together to, you know, get your, your final puzzle, okay? So, yeah, so this is, this is very important concept. Now, what are the advantages of hierarchical architectures over flat non-modular systems? So you can see that I have explained, I have like given you a few examples, but these examples are based on, let's say, intuition, but I would like you to use some graph theory concepts, okay, that we saw before, and think about how, for example, evolving systems, dynamically changing graphs, uh, you know, like if we perturb the system, which one would be more robust, okay? So you need to think about what are the advantages of formalizing my, my problem or putting my data in a modular way as to, you know, just connecting it in a, in a flat, non-modular manner, okay? So I'll give you guys like uh, five minutes and... I would like you to think about all possible um, advantages of using such hierarchical architecture. Okay? Pen and paper. 